Gigabyte made this. It's a heat sink. You've probably never seen one before. And this one has aluminum fins. So they're breaking the trend of motherboard manufacturers. We're very happy that Gigabyte has decided to do that. On the board it's on currently, the Gigabyte Gaming 7 X470 board, it's not actually necessary, which we'll show you through thermal testing. Today we're going to be putting some probes on a couple of MOSFETs, running it through various tests with the 2700X, and looking at the thermal results and then talking about why they are the way they are. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. So as noted, you'll see in a moment that this isn't entirely necessary on this motherboard, but it's a good move in the right direction. And if we can get manufacturers into the habit of making heat sinks with actual fins instead of just a giant block of aluminum with no surface area, that'd be a good thing overall, because eventually these types of designs, as simple as it seems, do carry over to boards like the Intel boards, for example, where you're probably dealing with higher power consumption and power throughput with a heavy overclock. Or to might carry over to boards even in an X470 line that just use weaker power stages and fewer of them. For this board, the Gaming 7, we have a buildzoid analysis of it already, which you should check out on the channel if you haven't. But the short of the important features here is that Gigabyte's using a 10 plus 2 phase setup, and they are using IR3553 MOSFETs, which are 40 amp power stages. So not really that in need of cooling in the form of a heat sink with fins, but it doesn't hurt. The Asus motherboard we have, the Crosshair 7 Hero, is kind of like the Gigabyte VRM, except even more extreme. It uses 60 amp power stages on also a 10 plus 2 design, so it's even less in need of heat sinking. But let's go over the numbers for what our K types said when we put them on the, the MOSFETs. We had two on here primarily, so we had one on the uh, what would be the top side of the VRM, and it was on the inner MOSFET, so it's going to be the warmer one, which is adjacent to the SOC VRM. And we had the SOC VRM running at 1.2 volts for the overclock tests, uh, which would generate some neighboring heat and, and kind of warm that up. We also had a probe on one of the central MOSFETs over here on the vertical part of the VRM, V-Core VRM, and it was in the center because that's where it'll get the hottest, so we wanted to see what the hot spots looked like. Let's get the chart on the screen. With the 2700X left to stock and XFR2 configured to stock settings, we measured a maximum V-Core VRM MOSFET temperature of 52.4 degrees Celsius with a 41 degree measurement for the top MOSFET measured. TDI was 59.5. And note that these are not deltas over ambient, they're just straight temperatures. Ambient was 28 degrees for every test, and we did actively log it anyway just in case. Overclocking to 4.2 gigahertz and 1.4 volts, 1.41, pushed our MOSFET temperatures to 65 degrees for the left V-Core MOSFET, or 51 for the top MOSFET. This is with extreme LLC for V-Core and high LLC for SOC voltage. Note that this is also with an SOC voltage of 1.2, so our neighboring SOC is providing some heat, the SOC VRM. At these settings, we're pushing 139 watts into the motherboard for Blender at the EPS 12 volt rails when stock, or about 186 watts when overclocked. This is about a 30 minute test and we're measuring the average high temperatures after that steady state is reached. Removing the heat sink entirely, the left MOSFET operated at 56 degrees Celsius, so about four degrees warmer than the complete stock configuration with the heat sink, which was 52 degrees. The top MOSFET operated at 56 degrees Celsius for a 15 degree increase over the 41 degree results with the heat sink. There's clearly an actual advantage to having a heatsink, and that's primarily realized at the top part of the VRM, but it's ultimately not a make or break situation. Removing the heatsink and overclocking still keeps us within reason. There is no real change for the left side, and we're within variance of the original overclocks with heatsink results. There's, however, a 16 degree increase for the top MOSFET. Even still, that FET is still only hitting 65.5 degrees, which is completely reasonable. As we said in Buildzoid's video, part of the reason you're seeing the performance you are is because we think these vendors might be planning for a future higher core count CPU. AM4 is going to be around for a while. The board vendors might be trying to plan ahead so that their motherboards remain relevant and they don't have to keep refreshing them every time a CPU launches. So that's probably part of why 
the VRMs are overkill on most of the X470 boards right now that we've looked at. And also would explain, of course, why you have potentially more powerful heat sinks that are needed. Of course, that's a good thing to do in general. In terms of the temperatures you want these things to run at, for capacitors, you're probably targeting under 105 degrees Celsius. At 105C, a lot of caps on the market will last either five or 10,000 hours, some bad ones are 2.5 thousand hours. That's at 105C. And you start losing large portions of life for every 10 degrees Celsius you go up in capacitor temperature. For the MOSFETs, which are the parts that are actually getting warm that we're measuring, you really don't want to go over 125, 150C, depending on if you're talking about uh, TKs or whatever its internal over temperature protection is, if it has one that tends to be 150 degrees Celsius. And at that point, you might get some derating, you'll definitely get some inefficiency, and if it, you really push it too hard, it could pop, but most of the MOSFETs on boards like this have over temperature protection that should prevent that scenario from happening. Clearly, we're very far away from 150 degrees. We're still far away from 125 degrees. So either way, either number you pick, you're well within safety margins, even without a heat sink. Of course, we'd recommend leaving it on because it doesn't hurt. It helps performance, clearly. If you put a, a fan directly over it, it'll help even more. We had no airflow for this test by design because we wanted to just do it without airflow and see how much difference we saw. And uh, I mean, it's, it's fine. It helps to have it. We're very happy to see Gigabyte adding this, but uh, it's also not necessary on this board and it's not gonna be necessary on any other board of this type with an actually really good VRM for Ryzen 2 overclocking just because you're not gonna be pushing that much power uh, in general unless you start doing things with LN2, in which case you have different things to consider anyway. As for the power going through these, Buildzoid has a video on our channel already talking about that. He gives all the current ratings, uh, theoretical voltages, watt draw, stuff like that. Check the video for more information on that. There is a bit of an exponential voltage curve as frequency increases. So once you start hitting 4.2 gigahertz, to get beyond that or even to 4.2 requires, uh, we've actually plotted it out for a future video, but the curve basically goes like that. So uh, it's more of a straight line at some point. Uh, so you do kind of run into voltage walls before you run into cooling walls with the VRM anyway. And Ryzen 2 is certainly power hungry, but uh, it's got limits still. So yeah, uh, well done on the VRM cooling and the VRM in general, Gigabyte. The whole thing is good in our books. The, Heat sink's completely unnecessary, but we're not going to be mad about it because this is what I've been asking for for a year now. I'm happy to see it, and I'm excited to see it for boards that actually do need it, which will be coming out at some point this year. Uh, as for the rest, BIOS is somewhat barren on the Gigabyte Gaming 7. We would like to see more memory subtiming options. We'd like to see better tuning for memory subtimings with various kits. There are some kits that work better than others in this board. Uh, the Gigabyte board needs some work in automatic memory timings in general for anything below the kind of primary six or so timings. And also more power limit options would be nice to see. So BIOS is definitely Gigabyte's weakest aspect of their motherboards, but the VRM is, is doing quite well. So uh, overall, we could recommend the board if you needed something in this price range. It's, there's not a lot to be mad about. If you really need something heavy duty for overclocking, ASUS still has the best BIOS right now for Ryzen 2000. It's just kind of a question of whether you're really going to need all of those options, and a lot of people don't, and you do pay for those options. So if it's not something that uh, you know you're gonna use, then you could save some money. So then the next board that we'll be looking at is the Crosshair 7 Hero. We use this for some of our review as well. We're using it in a lot of other testing for feature tests with Ryzen 2. Check back for that. Subscribe for more as always. There's a lot more coming out soon. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Help us out directly. Store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like this one, which is on back order now. We'll have more in in a couple of, probably let's call it five to six weeks to be safe. They'll be shipping out. And I'll see you all next time. <laughs>